I like to say that consciousness is very slow. It's overrated in many ways. <laughs> but the primal brain has the capacity to frankly hijack our entire body in order to save us because the cost of making a bad decision is not as important as not making the decision at all. From the offices of the Weill Cornell Medicine Brain and Spine Center in New York City, this is Your Brain with Dr. Phil Stieg. Internationally renowned scientist and researcher, Dr. Phil Stieg is neurosurgeon-in-chief of the New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell Medical Center. This week, Dr. Stieg and his guests explore marketing to your primal brain. Hello. I'd like to welcome Christoph Marin a pioneer and expert in the field of neuromarketing, which combines neuroscience and marketing in order to better understand the effects of advertising on the human brain. Today, we are here to discuss Dr. Marin's book, The Persuasion Code, How Neuromarketing Can Help You Persuade Anyone, Anywhere, Anytime. Sounds too good to be true, but here we go. Christoph, great to meet you, and thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure. So you came to this, originally you were a neuroscientist, and then you... I was not. I was originally a marketer that originally became a, marketer. a neuroscientist. <laughs> and then you became a neuroscientist. By design? By design. Okay. Yeah, because you see, I was so frustrated to complete uh, the typical research protocol in marketing is to ask people, what do you think? How do you feel? And I very quickly became frustrated because one, I couldn't really trust what people would tell me. Two, uh, it also became obvious that they just didn't have the consciousness, the ability to observe their behavior and decisions. And many of those decisions were happening in milliseconds inside their brain. And therefore, I figured, well, if it's that quick, I better learn more about the brain and figure a way to safely and ethically monitor brain activity and create metrics that complement what is called self-reported uh, techniques. Christoph, can you define what's different about what traditional people do in a focus group versus what you do in terms of really measuring and deriving brain metrics? Of course. Self-reported methods, including surveys, focus groups, put the cognitive effort onto people to describe their experience. I believe that that data is flawed and only approximative to the real experiences. The reason I developed this set of other techniques is because they do not require people to make necessarily cognitive effort to comment on their impressions. The typical uh, experimental setting is when people are asked to passively watch or interact with media content. It could be a website, it could be a commercial. And while they do that, we have sensors that are placed either on their skin, for instance, to measure the sweat activity, it's called skin conduction or heart rate, breathing patterns also can be informative as well. We go into the visual system by tracking people's eye movements, what are called gaze fixations, as well as decoding the facial movements. And we have over 40 muscles on our face that are um, basically placing our face in particular configuration. And the good news about this part of the research, Dr. Ekman long ago, demonstrated that as humans, we have common facial expressions for specific emotions. So the software that we use is informed by the teachings of Dr. Ekman so that we can reveal uh, three times per second if people are you know, paying attention or bored or disgusted or, or fearful. And finally, we can use EEG in order to calculate cognitive effort and in fact, cognitive asymmetry, I, I don't know if you've ever done research like that, but it's really quite powerful to determine if there is some sort of dominance of either the right or the left frontal lobe. Uh, this work was done decades ago by a neuroscientist, and now we use it as neuromarketers as a predictor of decision making. Left signals that people are about to approach a decision, and right dominance would signal the opposite. What you're proposing in this book is really an analytical way of looking at how an individual responds. I, of course, simplify to some extent the very complicated brain systems uh, into two major systems, one that I call primal, which is also what Daniel Kahneman did in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. He calls it system one, 
the part of our nervous system which is attending to our survival purposes, and then the rational brain, which he describes as system two. So I figured to tap into the primal brain, I really needed to look at the peripheral nervous system and capture information that could tell me more about emotions, about our state of attention, especially early attention. And so the methods became obvious as I was looking for the kinds of research questions that marketers struggle with all the time. What's going on within the first few seconds that can explain why people jump off a, a website in just a few seconds? What can we tell about the visual tracking of the areas of interest in a commercial that seems to engage more so than text or voiceover. The thing I find most interesting is the whole facial imaging analysis, looking at the slightest twitching of an eye or whatever, voice analysis in terms of the way they do it. I mean, it's, it's really you're looking at almost every potential biological response that I could have to something you put in front of me. Exactly. And of course, many of those technologies were not necessarily used for this purpose. For instance, voice analysis is a technology I found in Israel where they um, have urgencies around monitoring terrorists' activities. And they found that while they could not necessarily identify what people say, particularly in they speak uh, using codes, they do have voice patterns that are encoded in the voice recording. And those voice patterns can signal the presence of very specific emotions like anger or confusion or the intention to deceive. And so I repurposed that technology for conducting you know, in-depth interviews during which I could listen and transcribe what people tell me. But on top of that, I would have my emotional highlighter coming from those patterns of voice data. What I liked about the book was you made it easy to understand. I mean, when you talk about the primal brain, that's, that's a term everybody can grab onto instead of the limbic system, you know, what the that's heck is right. that? And then the rational brain is the, you know, the higher part of the brain. It, it seemed in reading through the book that most of us make our decisions almost instantaneously and emotionally. Is that true? Yes, I do believe the primal brain is the first system to respond for good reasons. The urgency of keeping us alive far exceeds the need to fully understand what's going on. When you walk in a forest and there is a stick that looks like a snake, you don't necessarily approach it, you move away from it. And this is a, like a knee-jerk response. You don't really have the time to think about it. I like to say that consciousness is very slow. It's overrated in many ways. <laughs> but the primal brain has the capacity to, frankly, hijack our entire body in order to save us because the cost of making a bad decision is not as important as not making the decision at all. So during the election seasons, I mean, how many TV networks have these focus groups where, where they monitor heart rate? It seems to me that if I want to know what Christoph is thinking, that's not the most effective way because there's peer group pressure and all the other things. I agree. And, and that's why there's been so many discussions around uh, polling people about what their votes will be. And then after the vote has been casted to find these huge discrepancies, we simply don't necessarily do what we say we're going to do. I do understand that we have this beautiful rational brain, this neocortex, but the truth is it's costly to use and operate, and our default is much more to follow whatever direction the primal brain is giving us. Clearly, you've convinced me that the primal brain is something that we really need to look at when we're trying to push something. And you talk about the primal bias model. You had uh, was about six categories. Can you go through those for us? Of course. The first is the need to protect from threats and suffering. And so the primal brain has in its programming real urgency around vigilance. And vigilance, as I like to say, is kind of the default program of the primal brain. In advertising alone, we receive 30 to 40,000 messages per day. That message could be a landing page, it could be a billboard, it could be an ad on the radio. How can we unhook from what we are doing unless we receive a message that does speak to the primal brain and that message in my opinion should take into account threats suffering hurdles frustrations that people find intolerable 
And so to the extent that you do that, you're demonstrating your ability to diagnose the why behind your product or service. And two, you're also finding a way to hijack whatever attention you need to deliver your message. So that's the first one. The second one in the primal brain, we don't have the luxury of computational neurons that would give us uh, excitement around uh, assessing 15 reasons why we should buy this product. We want to be done with the decision. We have the bias of accelerating decisions, which is why whenever you sell anything, you have to create a shortlist. And that shortlist, at least in my uh, research, is really no more than three, what we call claims. As you know, our frontal lobe is also not very skilled at manipulating more than three blocks of information. So from that perspective, I encourage people to use contrastable stories or claims that really establish right away, this is the path that I'm guiding you to. Not, please examine all our reasons, which most marketers tend to do. Number three, the primal brain doesn't have a lot of cognitive appetite. Yes, we can do basic math, but for the most part, we are not that interested in engaging in cognitive processing. So we need to work much harder than most marketers do to simplify the message. Nobody is gonna ever complain that you made it easy on their brain to understand the reasons why you should buy from them. And it's so amazing to me how many messages are complicated and people don't even see the complication. Like in Super Bowl ads, a lot of those messages have intense voiceover. And if you turn off the audio of most of those ads, you'll never understand what they're talking about. Voiceover is extremely painful for processing purposes and energy purposes, and most marketers ignore it. It kind of gets back to what you said earlier. The brain is about conserving energy, not expending energy. So you, exactly. you know, it's, it's the keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and it's true. I mean, those principles exist. People have said that. You know, David Ogilvy, who's a very famous, very skilled advertiser, said, you know, to sell, it's easy. All you need to do is light the fire under people's chair, yeah. i.e. reawake the pain, and then present the extinguishers. Yep. Now, look at how many messages are all about the extinguishers. And they sort of assume, they make it implicit. Well, our primal brain is, on a, is not an implicit brain. You've got to make it clear to me that you're on a mission to eliminate what I cannot find tolerable. But you've got to make it memorable also. You know, fire under the seat, is, you're going to remember it because it burned, but you know, not every message is memorable. How do you do that? That's the fourth yeah. bias. Um, as you know, our brain really sucks at remembering. <laughs> let's, be, let's be clear, right? I, I always say our brain is, I think, uh, more designed to forget than it is to remember. On top of that, most of what we remember is done while we sleep, right? So um, I tell my clients, you have to work much harder to make your message sing. Almost like a jingle. That annoying jingle we can get out of our head that should be your message. And so we teach very basic techniques of making your message rhyme. Uh, we teach repetition. Repetition may be annoying, but it works. <laughs> and so how do you do that? Well, by repeating the same message, not by changing it all the time, which is a common mistake of most advertisers. And of course, advertisers make money only to the extent that they change your message often. And so they're biased towards changing your message all the time. I'm, I'm aging myself, but it reminds me of the old Alka-Seltzer plop, plop, fizz, fizz ad. It transformed that company way back when, whatever that was. It's, uh, it just caught on. Precisely. It does pay to repeat. Number five is really our dominance of the visual system. You know, the visual cortex is occupying roughly a third of the space in the brain. I've read some data points which uh, suggest that at any given point, nearly 50% of our entire energy in the brain is used, metabolized for some sort of visual processing function. The final step in your primal bias model was about emotion. Why is that important? So I became very interested in the neurobiological basis of emotions. There are tons of models. Many of them are based on our rational understanding of emotions, which seems a little paradoxical. 
Uh, but it's clear to me that emotions have this purpose of either helping us approach a situation or avoid it. Some people have argued that we could experience nearly 60,000 emotions during our lifetime. And yet we only have 6,000 words to describe them. So what became important for me is to research emotions and their contributions to persuasion. And the research states very clearly that we need emotions to actually push or influence a decision. Uh, Antonio Damasio, a very uh, prolific and, and incredible researcher, has proven that people who have diseased limbic areas can't make decisions at all. And so we need to recruit the emotional system. He, he said, we're not thinking machine that feel. We're feeling machines that think from time to time. I love that quote from Damasio, right? It says it all. <laughs> the other yeah. thing that I found out is, is emotions can be considered the glue of your message. We uh, tend to remember more when events are emotional. And in fact, that process of emotional marking is not even conscious most of the time. That's why any of us would remember where we were and how we felt when we learn about the destruction of the Twin Towers. This won't be a big effort to retrieve because the emotional cocktail created the glue of the message. So I tell my client, you can be neutral as you want, but this is a complete waste of time and money. And I have so many customers that are trapped into brand, you know, rules or politically correct and so on. And by the time you look at this, it's as neutral as, you know, chewing gum commercials. Right? White bread. Oh, white bread. Exactly. <laughs> and, and they are afraid, actually, of having a tone, an emotional tone. So the one thing you can actually give to the people who make uh, Super Bowl commercials, they're not terribly afraid. The problem is they're putting glue on a message that has the or substance. <laughs> so it's not going to be terribly <laughs> helpful. But if you do what I recommend you do, if you really work on crafting a narrative that is informed by pain, by claims, and by gain evidence, then that glue is going to be absolutely necessary. Can images that flash by too quickly for us to really see influence what we buy? Decades ago, marketers claimed success with a technique called subliminal advertising. Some called this a dangerous experiment in mind control. Or was it merely an overhyped stunt based more on advertisers' wishful thinking than on science? Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. The this catchy jingle, accompanied by singing and dancing popcorn and candy boxes, appeared in movie theaters in the 1950s to remind audiences about all the delicious snacks available at the concession stand. But some advertisers wondered if they could convince people to buy movie snacks with invisible ads. In 1957, market researcher James Vickery told reporters that during a recent showing of the movie Picnic at a theater in New Jersey, single frames of ads were flashed on screen every five seconds. I love you, Madge. Do you hear? Really, I want you in the house this minute. Do you love me? Do you? Listen, baby. You're the only real thing I ever wanted. The inserted frames, which read, Drink Coca-Cola and Hungry? Eat Popcorn, were only visible for a fraction of a second. Vickery claimed that after the screening, Coke sales increased by about 18 percent, and popcorn sales went up nearly 60 percent. Vickery's press conference backfired. In the U.S. and the U.K., news of the unauthorized test was met with outrage from consumers who feared being deceived and manipulated. What's more, Vickery couldn't duplicate the test's results, and he later admitted to fabricating the numbers. For the next three decades, scientific studies of subliminal advertising seemed to confirm that it didn't work. But beginning in the 1990s, new research suggested otherwise. Since then, multiple studies have found that subliminal messages do register in our brains. Brain imaging shows that when subjects watch subliminal messages, activity levels change, not only in the visual cortex, but in the amygdala, which processes emotions, and in the hippocampus, where memories form. 
Studies also showed that subliminal messages can't hypnotize you or dramatically change your behavior. Ian Zimmerman, an experimental psychologist, wrote in Psychology Today that subliminal ads could influence consumers, but only up to a point, and not very powerfully. In other words, subliminal ads might make you briefly crave a certain type of soda, but they won't compel you to get up off your couch and go to the store to buy some. Of the five senses, visual is the most important to hook somebody with? In my reading, that's where the primal brain goes. And, and autonomically, the, you know, the, the, the eyes are connected straight to the primal brain. Uh, and the optic track, uh, of course, continues all the way to the back of our head. But our first hub of visual processing is in the primal brain. There's this tiny little area, which I like to brag about, called the superior colliculus. And this is our first visual station. Without consciousness, we can see. And we see in milliseconds. In fact, there are, there are cases called blindsight cases of people who have diseased visual cortices, but have an impeccable superior colicosis. And they can actually orient themselves without technically the capacity to see like a, a normal person. So yes, I do believe that the speed and the volume of information that we get from the visual sense is enough to deliver a story in just a few milliseconds. And I tell people, lead with the visual. And if you're lucky, it will elaborate from visual to the reading and the cognitive, which is what I call the bottom-up effect, the primal first and the rational second. In your book, you showed that photograph of the great white shark swimming behind somebody. You know, you know, it, it obviously caught my eye in terms of personal survival <laughs> and the relevance to preparing with insurance. Can you give us some examples of how you've reached people through the primal brain and transformed behavior? So this campaign you're suggesting on insurance is a very interesting one. Insurance is an interesting industry. I've worked for Prudential, insurance, and others. They tend to go about their products in a rational way. It's very text-centric. It's very much designed to demonstrate that there is a logic behind buying life insurance. Well, the evidence is pretty clear. Nobody wants to talk about their death. If you <laughs> fail to actually confront that, <laughs> your message is not never going to be hitting the parts in the brain that are supposed to be involved in the decision of talking to an agent, right? So text is never going to trigger that decision. But showing this poor lady in the picture who's you know, trailed by a shark for just a few seconds helps people wake up to the reality of their death and the fact that you can die not just from a disease, but from an accident. And so this very small and presumably short event maybe just enough to nudge the rational brain into, whoa, maybe it's time that I actually talk about this possibility that I could be disappearing from this earth. So I get that in the insurance world, but I couldn't help thinking about the luxury market. You know, where, where's the pain point in a luxury market? You know, do I want to buy a Philippe Petit watch versus you know, some other major name brand, you know? Yep. Uh, do I want Louis Vuitton versus something else? You know, I, I don't see pain there. I do. Oh, you do. Okay. Enlighten me. Enlighten me. That's why you're doing this job. <laughs> <laughs> the great philosopher Spinoza, 500 years ago, suggested that pain and pleasure were basically the same thing. And I believe the evidence that we have on, on neuropathways that either stimulate or inhibit our responses are essentially the same, right? And so to me, people who need, they feel they need that last Rolex are in pain of not being visible enough or not important enough. Now, are they going to ever talk about it that way? Of course not. And so luxury is, is really a response to frustrations or fears that some people have of not appearing as important, as rich as they really are. So let me turn this around. I was having a conversation about you know, healthcare in America is going to be dependent upon convincing people that they can prevent their disease. Diabetes, obesity, 
are all preventable diseases. How do we start an ad campaign to get people to realize that so that they buy the right food and live the appropriate life? We've, we've known about this for you know 100 years, but we still haven't achieved that goal. Give me some insight. Oh, it's such an important topic, and I've given my time to a lot of cause-related or PSA-related campaigns. There are ways to activate more interest and I think more responsibility by using these principles. Since you and I share the, the love of old campaigns, so to speak, you know, the, the campaign against drugs, which featured eggs, is in all people's mind. You know, this is your brain. Okay. This is your brain. This is drugs. This is your brain on drugs. This is the brain on drugs, okay? <laughs> well, as simplistic as this may be, millions of people remember this campaign. Millions of people develop this fear, which at some level, especially when it comes to illegal drugs, you have to be in a state of fear <laughs> to activate the primal brain. So is this the emotional cocktail that you're referring to? It is. What we've got to find? Yes. And so for everything that we want to persuade somebody on, we've got to find the emotional cocktail. Without an emotional lift, you're leaving people hanging into that fear state. That's not at all what I'm recommending. I'm recommending that in order to move through the process of persuasion, you have to put people into that primal connection so that they understand that your intention, your product, your services are all about lifting you up. That's the dopamine effect. That's what the dopamine will ultimately reward, is this anticipation that you can be lifted out of your misery. Well, hopefully we'll be able to do it for the preventable diseases. <laughs> From your lips to God's ears. <laughs> Look, I, I'm making this public, but if you know of an organization or work with an organization that need help and would be open to my scientific approach, I'm, I'm all game. I'm really at, at a point in my life. I'll be in touch. Okay. <laughs> so my last question then will be, what do you think we need to do in the future? I mean, clearly in reading your book, people can be manipulating or trying to manipulate my mind any day, any moment. Yeah. Whether I turn on my digital device, I turn on my TV. What do I as an individual need to do to make sure that I'm not a victim of that? Oh, that's a great question. Number one, since the visual channel is the most dominant, protect yourself by not openly watching as much content, whether it's from advertising or news media, especially. So there's an instant way to protect yourself from the stimulation that you may receive. Number two, if you learn the model, then you may learn ways to protect yourself from emotional you know, cocktails that do not seem authentic or somehow push you into committing you know, a purchase or, or a contract that doesn't really serve you. So being able to recognize also that we may not like to think, but thinking is good for us, <laughs> right? <laughs> And have more deep appreciation for our rational brain, this poor system that is desperate sometimes to help us and, and ultimately doesn't do much if we constantly shortcut using the primal brain. Yeah. So your solution is a better educational system to get people to think more. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Christoph, it's been a delightful time sitting here chatting with you, talking about the interplay between the primal emotional portion of our brain and the rational cognitive parts of our brain and the role that they both play in our decision process, either in marketing, but even more importantly, from my perspective as a doctor, in terms of our lifestyle and our behavior and our relationships with one another. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure. This Is Your Brain with Dr. Phil Stieg is produced for the Weill Cornell Brain and Spine Center by the Really Interesting Picture Company. The episode producers are Hildy Rubin and Liz Witham. The series is directed and edited by Tom Veltri with music by Lenny Williams. The announcer is Mindy Weisberger. Sign up for our newsletter and get access to special episode-related bonus content at thisisyourbrain.com. 
and follow us on Facebook at This Is Your Brain.